It turns out that every breath you take may be killing you slowly. Welcome to the first installment of Dad Explains Everything, the series that teaches you how stuff actually works without selling you some viral nonsense in the process. I have another series where I debunk tech, wellness, and social topics in case you're interested. Today I'm covering the invisible soup we live in, indoor air. In one video, you'll find out what's polluting it, what actually helps clean it, what's a complete scam, and what you can do, today, for not a lot of money. Because even though your lungs are technically indoor organs, they still deserve clean air. You may be wondering, what's polluting my air? Well, your air is full of stuff. Some of it's harmless, and some of it's less so. The main culprits are particulate matter, specifically size PM2.5 and PM10. These are tiny particles from cooking, dust, smoke, and outdoor air. Then there are volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. These come from off-gassing furniture, paints, cleaning supplies, candles, and air fresheners. Then we have biologicals. These are things that are alive or came from living things, like mold spores, pet dander, dust mites, pollen, and bacteria. And then there are gases. Carbon monoxide is deadly. Nitrogen dioxide from gas stoves isn't great either. Depending on where you live, radon can be extremely harmful. Oh, and too much CO2 from you, you know, breathing, can be bad too. Fun fact, EPA studies found that indoor air can be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. Indoor concentrations of VOCs in US homes were often 10 times higher than outdoors. Less fun fact, we spend over 90% of our time indoors. So a logical follow-up question would be to ask if air quality in homes is pretty uniform. And it turns out that it's not. It may be surprising to some, but older homes tend to have higher indoor air quality. Why? Because older homes are more poorly sealed. That's bad for energy efficiency, but it's good for ventilation. Older homes may also have fewer synthetic building materials and or may have materials that have already fully off-gassed their VOCs. Newer homes are built to be airtight, and this reduces heating and cooling losses. This limits natural ventilation, meaning that pollutants from cooking, cleaning, furniture, paints, etc. get trapped inside. Newer homes tend to use engineered wood products, VOC-heavy paints and sealants, and synthetic carpets, adhesives, and foams. These materials off-gas chemicals like formaldehyde, benzene, and toluene for months or even years. If you're building a new home, you can mitigate the situation by requesting low VOC materials. You can also incorporate an energy recovery ventilator, or ERV, or a heat recovery ventilator, or HRV. These measures can dramatically improve air quality, but they also add significant costs to a new build. The fact that there's something called sick building syndrome should signal that this money, if you have it, is well spent. Oh, and I found out recently that this is some kind of cultural hot button issue, but gas stoves are huge polluters of indoor air. While all high temperature cooking emits some pollutants, gas stoves are by far the worst, emitting nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and toxic compounds like formaldehyde, benzene, and other VOCs. Studies show that gas stoves leak methane even when off and can exceed indoor safety limits for nitrogen dioxide within minutes of use. Consider exchanging your gas stove for a safer electric unit. And if you can't or won't, be sure to use a range hood that vents to the outside every time and use an air cleaner near the stove. I can hear you asking, how bad is it really? The answer isn't a simple one. Poor indoor air quality can cause a wide range of health issues some short-term and irritating, others long-term and serious. The effects depend on what pollutants are present, how long you're exposed, and your individual health and sensitivity, for example, asthma, age, and immune status. Short-term effects can appear as quickly as a few minutes and include irritation like burning, watery red eyes, scratchy throat, congestion, sneezing, dryness and rashes on your skin from formaldehyde or VOCs. Respiratory effects like coughing and wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and asthma flare-ups. Neurological effects like headaches, fatigue or sluggishness, dizziness, and nausea. Long-term chronic effects develop over months or years of exposure to indoor pollutants and include respiratory diseases, for example, developing or worsening asthma, chronic bronchitis or COPD, and lung infections. Then there are cardiovascular effects, like increased risk of heart disease, elevated blood pressure, and increased risk of stroke. 
you can get cancer. For example, radon is the number two cause of lung cancer after smoking. Formaldehyde, benzene, and other VOCs are linked to leukemia, nasal cancers, and more. There can be developmental and reproductive effects like low birth weight, premature birth, neurodevelopmental issues in children, and increased risk of childhood asthma and allergies. Not everyone is equally at risk, even with the same amount of exposure, so it's possible that you or your family may develop anywhere between none and all of these conditions. In the aggregate, though, the people most at risk are children. They have developing lungs and spend more time indoors. The elderly, who have weakened immune systems and existing conditions. People with asthma, COPD, or heart disease. And low-income households, where there's typically less ventilation and more indoor pollutants. So now that I've freaked you out, I'm going to start with the tools that actually make a difference. The first solution is an air cleaner. Worthwhile air cleaners generally range from 150 to thousands of dollars. Almost all of these cleaners incorporate a HEPA filter. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air, and this filter type traps 99.97% of particles down to 0.3 microns. That's great for dust, pollen, pet dander, and smoke. Some of these cleaners also have an activated carbon filter stage. Activated carbon can absorb VOCs and odors, but many of these filters are not thick enough for this stage to be very effective. Regardless of which air cleaner you go with, it's important to make sure that the capacity is appropriate for your room size. Capacity, in this context, is measured with Clean Air Delivery Rate, or CATR. CATR is expressed in cubic feet per minute, and is usually provided for three types of pollutants, smoke, dust, and pollen. The idea is that you will calculate the volume of your room, taking the height, width, length, and multiplying them together. Take your catter, multiply by 60, and divide that by the room's volume and you'll get the number of air changes per hour. An appropriate air cleaner will give you at least 5 air changes per hour. A higher catter rating equates to quicker cleaning and higher capacity filters. It can also mean a more expensive unit, more expensive filters, and possibly more noise. Regardless of what size the unit is, it will be more effective the closer you can get it to the center of the area it's in. Because an air cleaner is basically a plastic box with a fan and some filters, vendors try to differentiate their capabilities through extra features. Air quality sensors and app control are some of the more common bells and whistles. While those capabilities are fine, I think I'd make the argument that leaving your air cleaner on all the time at a constant speed is probably best, so I'd consider extra features to be optional. Less common are items like ionizers and UVC treatment. These types of features are usually marketed as targeting viruses, bacteria, and mold spores. Some claim to break down VOCs or make particles stick together for easier capture in a HEPA filter. Can these features work, theoretically? Yes. Do they work as marketed in these devices? No, not really. Important factors in selecting an air cleaner are filter life and filter cost. Generally, you want the cheapest air cleaner that has both the catter you need, but enough of a market presence to have third-party aftermarket replacement filters. This is really important because filters are an ongoing expense. Over the years, I've overpaid for a variety of air cleaners. These days, I generally find or recommend whatever Winix cleaner is appropriate for the room size in question. If you're looking at an air cleaner over a few hundred dollars, it's probably not a great buy. I'm open to discussing air cleaner options that make sense for whatever environment you have in the comments below. Most homes have a built-in air moving system. If you have central air conditioning, you have one or more air returns and several air registers. Intake air filters at the grate or at the air handler were primarily intended to keep dust and particulates off of the internals of your HVAC system. If you want to take it a step further, you can upgrade the filter. This isn't for everyone though and may not be a good step for you if you go months at a time without using your HVAC. Getting an upgraded HVAC filter is complicated by the fact that there isn't a single system for rating these filters. Instead, we have Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value, or MERV, which comes from an actual public standard. There's also Microparticle Performance Rating, or MPR, used by 3M with their Filtreat filters, and Filter Performance Rating, or FPR, used by Home Depot and Honeywell. I'm pretty sure that there are international standards for this as well, and hopefully the situation is better outside of the U.S. 
with these different uh, standards, direct comparison is impossible, but this table shows how they stack up approximately. Since I've given you this handy table, let me explain the MERV ratings. MERV 1 through 4 is pretty much useless. MERV 8 is okay for large particles and basic protection. MERV 11 through 13 are pretty good for home use. They're good for fine dust, smoke, pollen, pet dander, and even some viruses. When you get to MERV 14 and higher, we're getting to hospital grade. But with great filtration comes great resistance. These filters may choke your system if it's not designed for it. A good retrofit, assuming you have your ducting easily accessible, is to add another air return in order to increase the trans filter flow rate. This counteracts the large drop in flow rate when adding in a very restrictive filter. You should expect your dad to nag you about this, but HVAC filter maintenance is very important. If you're not replacing your HVAC filter every one to three months of usage, you're not doing it right. Set a reminder on your calendar app and change your filters. The most boring and most effective fix is ventilation. Assuming you're in a climate that's conducive to it, outdoor ventilation is not sexy, but it works. If you want to get the stale air out, open windows when the weather and air quality allow. Use exhaust fans every time you're cooking, showering, or cleaning. Install a range hood that actually vents outside. If you have a microwave over your stove, make sure that it's venting to a pipe that goes outside. If not, you're just recirculating greasy air back into the room. And consider an HRV or ERV if your house is sealed tighter than your weed stash. Look, ventilation plus filtration equals actual results. Other means of improving air quality are effective, but ventilation is probably the most cost effective. Plants are green friends, but they're not air scrubbers. I'm not going to say a lot about this, but too many people are trusting their intuition and not the science on this one. Yes, NASA did a study in the 80s. No, that doesn't mean your three house plants are scrubbing toxins out of your drywall. The truth is that plants can absorb VOCs in controlled lab chambers. In your house, you'd need hundreds to make a measurable difference. Plus, overwatering leads to mold, and that snake plant you forgot in the corner, it's just posing. So why keep them? Because they're pretty, Sam. They reduce stress, and they may increase humidity a bit. Plants are cool, but they're not appreciably improving your air quality. Now we're to the stuff that claims to work, but doesn't. This one's for the snake oil salesman, so let's go down the hall of shame of viral, trendy, or overhyped solutions. First up, we have ozone generators. Bruh. Ozone is a pollutant. Ozone does kill odors, but it also irritates lungs, especially for kids, asthmatics, and, you know, humans. It also reacts with indoor VOCs to form formaldehyde and ultrafine particles, neither of which are good for you. Then we have ionic air purifiers. They may reduce some particles, but can produce ozone as a byproduct. No thanks. Salt lamps. Cute. Cozy. Literally do nothing for air. Essential oil diffusers. These add VOCs. They don't remove them. Your breathe blend is not a filtration system. I have a video on this if you want to know more about what essential oils do to humans and pets. Negative ion bracelets, pyramids, or quantum harmonizers. Pure wishful thinking. They do nothing and steal your money. Junk. Air purifying bags of bamboo charcoal. These absorb moisture and maybe some odors in small areas. Don't expect much. And UV lights slapped inside ductwork. These are only helpful if installed properly and maintained. Most are not. The litmus test is, if it doesn't say catter, HEPA, or have third-party testing, assume it's a cash-grabbing placebo with a power cord. If the ad includes someone waving a burning match at it, yeah, don't buy it. In case it wasn't already obvious, housekeeping is air keeping, and cleaning your home helps more than you think. Do this. Vacuum weekly with a HEPA vacuum. Not the clunky one from 2004 that sounds like a broken jet engine. Be sure to follow the directions for cleaning or changing your vacuum filter. Possibly augment your full vacuuming with a daily robot vacuum. Dust with a damp cloth and not a dry Swiffer that just kicks stuff into the air. Wash sheets, curtains, and soft furnishings regularly. Keep your pets groomed. 
and off your pillow. Control humidity. 30 to 50% is the sweet spot. Higher than that and you could get mold. Too low and you may experience dry coughs and cracked hands. Use a dehumidifier or a humidifier as needed. Pro tip. The more surfaces you clean, the fewer particles get recirculated into your lungs. For the data nerds, we have monitors and meters. You can't fix what you can't measure, and that's where smart sensors come in. You can try carbon monoxide detectors. These are mandatory if you have a gas stove or furnace. Radon tests, especially if you're in a high radon zone. PM 2.5 monitors. These are readily available on Amazon or Ikea, and they track air quality trends and not perfection. Humidity and carbon dioxide monitors. CO2 isn't dangerous in small amounts, but it's still good to know if you have fundamental ventilation issues. And look, you don't need all this gear, but if you're curious or live with someone with asthma or allergies, it's useful to have real data. To recap, Here's the game plan, in order of impact. If you want better air and don't want to waste your money, follow this priority list. 1. Source control. Stop polluting the air in the first place. No smoking indoors, and this includes vaping. Cook with ventilation. Minimize scented sprays, candles, and cleaners, and vacuum and dust regularly. 2. Ventilation. Let the bad stuff out, bring in some fresh stuff. Three. Get some air cleaners with HEPA and carbon air filters. Four, use HVAC filtration, preferably MERV 11 or higher. Five, humidity control, between 30 and 50%, dry enough for dust mites, moist enough for your lungs. Six, measurement, this is optional. This helps tweak your setup, but it's not essential. And seven, plants, these are really optional. And it's if you want greenery and not air purification. My final word is that you don't need to live in a hermetically sealed NASA funded bunker to have clean air. You just need one or more air cleaners, a decent filter or two, some fresh air now and then, less junk that smells like mountain breeze but is made in New Jersey, and maybe, just maybe, a little less TikTok science. Your lungs are doing their best, now throw them a bone. Go change your HVAC filter and step away from the Himalayan salt orb. Please like this video, subscribe if you aren't already, and check out my other content. Have a great day.